and a bigger welcome to the new faces that have come along to join us. Um, those of you that have been here before must be getting fed up to look at this 787 on the screen here. You'd think I would find other aeroplanes to put up there, but I mean, but I will, I will next time. Um, one thing I just want to say about that 787, because there's a kind of a bit of a myth that, you know, people get a bit of a cold or a flu after they've been flying and they say, Do you know what, it's those germs flying around inside that airplane all the time. And I just want to tell you about that. This machine here, Boeing claim that this gets rid of 99% of pathogens. You got to take their word for it, 99% of pathogens because of an, a sophisticated filtering system within there. So you really shouldn't be getting any colds, flus, bugs from anybody else that's near you. Um, what, what I'll get on to later, by the way, because I know there's been, there was some degree of reaction, because I got f feedback rather from some of the tables about the statement I made about the Hudson. But that incident on the Hudson will be coming up later on in this talk. But just to tell you about these pathogens in the air, the air in an aeroplane, a modern aeroplane, is changed every two to three minutes. Entirely. Better than the room you're sitting in, I'll tell you. Air is coming in off the engines. It's bleed air. It's clean air. It is filtered, as I was saying to you. And in the 787, it's humidifier, so it's extra moisture going into it. Temperature's regulated. And it's coming into the airplane, pressurizing the airplane, and going out of the airplane every two or three minutes. So you're not breathing stale air, and you're not breathing the breath of the guy beside you, by and large. So, you know, if you happen to get a cold or a flu, basically you got it from somewhere else. Now, a couple of little things, another few things I have to dispel. I mean, I don't want to get a reputation for dispelling myths. But one of the things um, is that you've been regularly told, I'm sure, with great frustration in an airplane to switch off your mobile phones and laptops and so on and take off. Well, let me tell you primarily, it's a bit of bunkum. It doesn't mean that I'm telling you now to keep your phone on because you're supposed to do what you're told in the airplane. But let me tell you, there has never been a known incident where there's any interference from anything electronic down the back. And I'll tell you how ridiculous it has become. The guys in the cockpits now, instead of carrying out a big navigation bag that is full of all sorts of maps and charts for routes they're going to fly and airfields they're going to go into, the guys now are downloading this stuff off an iPad on their knee, right smack up against the whole instrument panel. That's what they're doing. And you're told to switch your phone off down the back. So why are you being told to switch your phone off down the back? Where's the pressure coming from? The pressure's coming from the phone people, folks. There's a big, strong lobby of the telephone people. They don't like, they have difficulty finding out where the charge is coming from, how to make the charges, how to make up the bills. They've got a moving platform when people are on the phone like that, and they don't like it. And my understanding is there's a strong lobby from the telephone people into the airline industry for you guys to switch your phones off. So don't get too worried if you forget to switch your phone off. Now, it's interesting, but a number of discussions do come up at table. You can imagine that people come up and ask me things. And I'll just make a generalized comment. You know, in the aviation industry as much as in the motor industry and so on, unfortunately, there has to be a human cost or a human price before change comes about. The aviation industry, in some cases, and I'll give you one particular example. Um, from time to time, they know about a design defect in an airplane. Not big, perhaps, but a design defect. And it takes a long time to get that corrected because they don't want to get the airplane a bad reputation. So the most famous one was the DC-10. Now, DC-10 was a wonderful airplane. It got a bad reputation because it had a number of accidents. A lot of them, in fact, were pilot created. And a lot of them were fellas rejecting a takeoff at the wrong time and going off the runway in an airplane, breaking up, and sometimes they get a fire. But the point I want to get to is when they designed the DC-10, and it was on air test, test pilots are up one day, and the rear cargo door blew open on the airplane because it had a faulty latch system, a poorly designed latch keeping the door closed. Now, in the DC-10, the baggage area under the floor was pressurized just as the top of the airplane, the upper half of the deck where the people are sitting. And if the door blows open or falls off, underneath the floor becomes depressurized. And what happened to these guys is the floor sagged a bit, which it will. Suddenly, you have high pressure above the floor, negative pressure below, or low pressure, and the floor sags. And what does that do? All the cables for the flight controls and the engine controls are going down under the floor. And the guys had limited control of the airplane, but they landed the airplane. There were test guys, they landed the airplane. So McDonnell Douglas knew about this problem in the DC-10. 
and they were at that time on a promotion tour around the world with a number of DC-10s trying to sell these things. And a number of airlines bought them. And when they became aware of the faulty latch of the DC-10, they got onto the airlines who had it and said, by the way, guys, the next time this airplane is in for an overhaul, a degree of maintenance, we designed a new latch system for the rear door. Fit it when it comes in. But that just wasn't good enough. Because in the interim, what happened? The national Turkish airline, THY, was climbing out of Paris with a full load of passengers, 310 passengers on the airplane. And what happens? They're going through about 16,000 feet. The latch failed on the door at the back. The floor sagged. The guys could no, limited to no control over the engine power settings and the flight controls at the rear of the airplane. And everybody was lost in that airplane. Huge compensation was hit, of course, in McDonnell Douglas, and rightly so. So what you get is, I'm sorry, but at the end of the day, money runs so many things. And unfortunately, it does take a human cost sometimes before corrections. There are so many of those, and I'm sure those of you in industry can quote many others, but it was in the aviation industry as well. Now, really, today, I'm really quite busy because there's a lot, of, a lot to be done in this one today. And before I actually get into the black box area of it here, um, what I'll do is I want to show you, because I haven't shown you a side stick airplane to date. I've been showing you the ones which were all Boeing with a, a control column. Now, in this airplane here, if you look, there's no control column here. This is an A340, an Airbus 340. Four-engined airplane, not made anymore. Primarily long vol airplanes now are twin-engined airplanes, and they're more economical. Not just because of the two, but even on the power weight ratio and the improved performance of the engines. They're mostly two engines in long haul now, or at least a lot of them are. So this airplane, not made anymore. A very good airplane, but it's a side stick. There's a little uh, joystick over here for the captain, and there's a joystick on the right side here for the co-pilot. And you might remember yesterday when I was talking about Boeing leaving this control column in and the pilots getting feedback when they see the airplane move and so on. You don't get that here. These joysticks just sit still. But they operate the same as the control column. So why did we get into the situation of getting rid of the control column? Well, because the control column in the earlier days before the design of this sort of airplane by Airbus, it's now called fly-by-wire. It has been for some time called fly-by-wire. Before that, it was a cable system that I've just explained to you. Cables are heavy. They need a lot of maintenance. It's greasing all the little pulleys. It's a cumbersome system. It needs a high degree of maintenance. So to make things lighter, which makes the airplane lighter, and therefore it burns less fuel, they decided to get rid of all the, all the cable systems, and they put in what's called fly-by-wire. So to get the controls to work, when you move the joystick, it sends a little electrical signal all the way down, if it's the elevator or the rudder down at the back of the airplane, it's a little electrical signal and a little wire that goes all the way down there that weighs nothing. And it, down it goes, and it'll operate a big hydraulic actuator, which will do what you want to do. So all the cabling and all went out. So that's known as a fly-by wire. Another term used is glass cockpits because these are like uh, television screens as opposed to the old analog instruments we had a long time ago. Now that airplane there, the interesting thing because I was looking at a bit of video fairly recently, a genuine piece of film that was taken. The airplane, the Airbus was a, a, a joint venture between the British and uh, the Germans and the French. And uh, Margaret Thatcher, who was the Prime Minister of England at the time, when she went over to visit and look and see how this airplane was coming on, she goes into the cockpit and you see the bit of film and the training captain's on the left. And she comes in and when she looks, she knows there's something missing. So you hear her saying to the captain, what happened to the thing you used to have between your legs? <laughs> That's what she said. Which caused a bit of embarrassment because you, you see the guys looked at each other and I'm sure they were a bit red faced and I don't know how they talked their way out of that one. But there you go. So it, it, guys have a lot of nice room in there. They have a little tray here they can pull out to eat their meals on. And you know, if I get on to talking about, well, tomorrow, in fact, I talk about the life of a pilot and so on. Flying is about one of the only professions, you know, where you don't get a break from the job while you're eating. You can be on a 12 hour flight. And you know what? Your bum is in the seat pretty well all that time, unless you go to the bathroom. But otherwise, you're eating. And while you're eating there in front of you, you've got a headset on, you're tuned in, you're keeping an eye on the airplane, you're listening to ATC. You're not away from the job even while you're eating. It's a particularly unhealthy profession from that point of view. Um, because there's not many other things where you've just got to eat and stay on the job at the same time. But flying happens to be uh, one of those. All right, I won't tell you anything else about nicely streamlined uh, airplane here by and large, but I'll just I'll move on from that. Okay, so let's just talk about accidents here before I get into the black box hearing. So why do they happen? Loss of situational awareness. Sounds like a big clumsy term. What does it mean? It just means situational awareness is knowing what's going on around you. You know, 
In other words, if you're in an airplane, you want to know how things are. You want to know your height, your speed, where you are relative 